thing you are going to share to us. And <clears throat> give a continuation to the very last chapter of this book, Collection of Prayers. We're soon going to end, and we have to think about what we're going to do next. Going to do next. I don't think we'll be able to finish today. And today is interesting, the topic. Yeah. And I just lost my page. Give me a minute. Okay. It's a collection of prayers, and I think I'm saying that every month, but I'm going to say it again. It's, it's a conclusion of the book. And very often a conclusion is a is the last top chapter, is a conclusion of the book. Very often a conclusion is a summary of the whole book in itself. And this is not different. What Kadek does over here in this collection of suggested prayers that you can use as a suggestion, it brings the whole book in it. It brings the whole Christianity in it. In all of those prayers, we're going to see all the teachings of Christ immersed in it, contained in all of it. And again, why? Because we pray what we believe. And as spiritists, we believe that the teachings of Christ are indeed the, the best recipe for our happiness. We do understand that Jesus, not only believe, but understand that Jesus bring in his teachings the truth, the way in their life. And today we'll deal with the top of the enemies of spiritism. The last time, last Sunday, we spoke of our enemies. And I think we talk about a little bit of um, the word the enemy is this a complicated word, right? I mean, who is who is my enemy? Is my enemy those who sees me as an enemy? Then therefore it's my enemy also. If someone, someone sees me as an enemy, am I supposed to see that someone also as an enemy? Um those who have different ideologies, those who have different political, socio-economical desires or ideas than ours, are those individuals my enemy? If I am a Yank fan, a Red Sox fan is my enemy? Who is my enemy? Who do I consider to be my enemy and why? And I think something that each one of us has reflect individually I think that ideally, and that's me saying that as an spiritist, as a Christian, one of the things that you should work on, if you have not reached that yet, is to be able to abandon the idea that we have enemies. But again, it's very hard to consider that some individuals will see us as an enemy because we don't have, we don't think alike, we don't look alike, we don't have the same skin color, and so many products of our selfishness, of our pride, of our fragility makes us see others as an enemy and very often when we seek to understand the reason why we'll see that it's very foolish ideas it's very foolish foolish things that clashes completely with the teachings of christ so the word enemy personally to me is a is a complicated word and I think, again, ideally for us is to not see anyone as an enemy. Those who do not think like us, the best thing that we can do is listen carefully to what they say. What do they bring that can we can use for our own improvement? And of course, 
will give us not, not seven, but 70 times seven for each one of the offenses, right? Um, so we did speak, um, I'm gonna come to you in a, in a minute, Ebony. So we, we spoke about the enemies at the personal level, right? The last week was, for our enemies and for those who wish us ill. And then we have a prayer for them. And then we have a prayer for the benefit granted to our enemies. Well, it's a big thing, right? That's a very noble and if you have not reached that point yet, that's a great objective for us to try to reach, to be able to be grateful for the benefits granted to our enemies. And now we're going to expand that. We're going to talk about the enemies of spiritism. Not of spiritists, of spiritism. Uh, Ebony? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, I like to go a little bit further with that word enemies because um, I think we're we're at a stage in our evolution where we can now say, or we can at least try to eradicate that word from our, um, our vocabulary, our personal vocabulary. Um, I like to tell people that I, um, I don't have any enemy, enemies. Um, there are, yes, there are people who don't like me for one reason or another. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I do not have enemies. Um, I don't even know what that word means. And at times when I tell people that, they tend to look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> but I think it's a good exercise for us to practice. If we, the more we do it, um, it, it, it would actually make sense to us, especially as spiritists. Because like I said, um, I think it's about time that we eradicate that word from our everyday vocabulary. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think that's something for us to seek to reach to be over there. And I think because of our history of humanity, it's it's almost expected from us to have an enemy, right? <laughs> um, which is not to say that the one who does not see an enemy does not have ideologies, does not have goals, does not have things that want, the one wants to conquer, even at material level. But that does not mean that we have enemies. In the world that we live, there is a certain need of competition. We compete for things, right? If you go and apply for a job and three other people apply for, for a job, you are competing for that position with the other three. It's a fact. But are they your enemies because you're competing for the same position? Absolutely not, right? If the, hopefully in a, in a just system, the one who is better qualified will take the position and it is what it is. But unfortunately, is one of the vices of language that is, oh, that is my enemy. No, it's not. And when you accept this word as, as a fact, then you start to have a negative thoughts toward those individuals. So yes, eliminate the word enemies will help us to see people for what they are. It's, it, yeah, we are competing for the same position. Yes, he or she may be more qualified and he should deserve to have the position. This is just as simple as that. And we're not seeing if it's in, as, as individual, especially today with such a polarized uh, unfortunately, very polarized situation in our lives today is in everything. It is it's, it's, it's unbelievable in ideologies, in, in politics, in religions that we start to see the others as enemy. To imagine that Catholics and Protestants are fighting actual war, killing one another, how, how can you actually accept such a thing? Both Christians devoted to Christianity, killing one another, trying to put their own 
same way of seeing Christianity as one above others. How absolutely ridiculous is that? So we have we have to try to eliminate this word. We compete in life, the life that we live today, there is that competition. And we should make that as a health thing for society. So the better prepared we'll take the position and will help the whole humanity to get better as well. And we have to accept that there are people there that is better prepared than us for this or that function. And there is a place for us where we can um, put to good work our talents. Um, now you're going to the for the enemies of spiritism and again of a doctrine, okay, not of a, of individual, all right. Okay, we begin. For the enemies of spiritism, number 50. Bless are they who hunger for justice, for they shall be filled. Bless are they who suffer persecution for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Bless are you when men slander you and persecute you and wrongly say all sorts of evil against you for my sake. Rejoice, therefore, for great recompense is reserved for you in heaven, because in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew. Yes. Um, is everybody here hear well? Maybe my, my audio is a little bit low. We hear well. It's good. Good. Okay. So maybe my audio is low. Well, you guys can hear me well. Yes. It's interesting how, how Kardec places over here the Sermon of the Mountain and bringing the necessity for humility if you seek to conquer something that is worth it, something noble. Bless are those who hunger for justice because they'll be filled. Blessed are those who suffer persecution for righteousness, for there is the kingdom of heaven. So justice, righteousness, those are great noble objectives for us to conquer. And if we allow ourselves to be weakened by persecution, by injustices, then we are going to empower the unjust. They're going to give righteousness for those who combat combat righteousness. So if you are convict, have conviction, have absolute faith that what we are pursuing is, is the right thing to do it, then you must continue. And you're going and if you continue you're going to be exposed to injustices, to all kinds of negativity, um, persecution. It requires tremendous amount of faith. And this wonderful introduction that we're going to read here, um, item uh, 51, 51 is Perhaps one of the greatest thing I ever read, and it's going to completely explain everything that this introduction item fifth gives to us. So let's read it. Okay. Of all the freedoms, the most invaluable is that of thought, which also includes freedom of conscience. Casting anathemas against those who do not think as we do is to demand such freedom for ourselves while refusing it to others, thus violating Jesus' first commandment, charity and love for one's neighbor. 
to persecute them for their beliefs is to attack the most sacred right that all people have of believing in what is fit to them and worshiping God according to their understanding, obliging them to outward forms like our, like our own is to show that we are bound more to appearances than to conviction. Forced renouncement never brings faith. It produces only hypocrisy. It is an abuse of material power that does not demonstrate the truth. The truth is secure in and of itself. It convinces and does not persecute because it does not need to. Spiritism is an opinion, a belief. Even if it were a religion, why would persons not have as much freedom to say they are spiritists as they would have to say that they're Catholics, Jews, or Protestants? Adherents of this or that philosophy or this or that economic system. A belief is either false or truth. It is a false. If it is a false, it will fall by itself because error cannot prevail against the truth where minds are enlightened. If it is the truth, persecution cannot render it false. Okay, I don't see the top. Persecution is a baptism of every new idea that is great and just. It increases with the greatness and importance of the idea. The animosity and wrath of its enemies are in proportion to the fear it still in them. It is for this reason that Christianity was persecuted in the past and why spiritism is today, but with the difference that Christianity was persecuted by pagans, whereas spiritism is persecuted by Christians. The times of bloody persecutions have passed. That is true. But if one no longer kills the body, one torments the soul, attacking it in its innermost sentiments, in its dearest affections. Families are divided. Mother is incited against daughter, wife against husband. Even the body is attacked in its physical needs by taking away people's livelihood in order to afflict it with hunger. Spiritism does, do not, spiritists do not be troubled with the blows you are dealt, for they prove that you have the truth. Otherwise, you would be left alone and unharmed. It is a test of your faith, for it will be because of your courage, resignation, and perseverance that God will acknowledge you to be among God's faithful servants, of whom he is even now making note so as to give all their share according to their deeds. Following the example of the early Christians, be proud, therefore, to carry your cross. Believe in the words of Christ who said, Blessed are they who suffer persecution for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. He also said, Love your enemies. Do good to those who do you evil, and pray for those who persecute you. Show that you are his true disciples and that your doctrine is good by doing what he said and what he did. Persecution will last only for a while. So wait patiently for the dawn, for already the morning star appears on the horizon. Thank you. I mean, this is just brilliant. I think I read this three or four times. Every time that I read, that's called something new. I just love this, intro this introduction. Of all the freedoms, the most inviolable is that of thought, mm -hmm. which also includes freedom of conscience. That's basically what Descartes says, right? I mean, I think therefore I am. There is no way to cast to diminish, to prohibit the ability of ones to think. And if I think I am, and if I am, I have a conscience. Philosophically speaking, I can say, I am a conscience. <clears throat> when when Socrates was in prison and waiting for for the day of to drink the poison, and um, his friends were 
in jail talking to him and say, oh, we're so sorry that you are in prison. And said, no, who said I'm in prison? I'm supposed to not in prison. You are here, you cannot live. Well, I can. I can and I go in where I am. My body is imprisoned. I am not. I am free because I think. Because I have the ability of thinking. No one can violate that freedom. Those who seek to prohibit, prohibit us, those who reject our ideas, our beliefs, they can burn the books as they did. They can shut down the spiritual centers to the world if they have the power to do so, they can. But they cannot stop one from being a spiritist. They cannot derail this doctrine or any doctrine. Or any doctrine. You know, if if they could, things like the Judaism no longer exist. With all the, the persecution that the Judaism went through and the Iberica Peninsula throughout, throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East, they would not exist. Well, you cannot derail it. You cannot stop people from being where they are. Even if they have to hide themselves somewhat to, to survive, if they have to change the, their names to survive, they will survive because you cannot destroy faith. You cannot destroy a true, a true conviction. And what could be less Christian than to impose something upon anyone? Jesus, as much as I know I said that all the time, for my little understanding of his three, three years of teaching us, never come to someone and say, hey, come to me. I need I need you to follow me. No. Come over here, you who is blind. I want to restore your vision. On the contrary, he waits for those to come to him, to ask for him. And then you'd even ask, what do you want? There's a respect of the individual's ability of exercising the free will, of exercising the ability of thinking that is invaluable, that nobody can violate. So to seek to persuade, to seek to oblige someone to follow this or that idea is absolutely anti-Christian. So to persecute them for their beliefs is to attack the most sacred right of all people have of believing in what is fit for them and worshiping God according to their understanding. I think that the what is fit for them is very important. Each one of us at, at one stage of our more intellectual development and therefore things does not fit us equally and we do not fit into things um equally we are all equal yes created equal equal and um and ignorant and simple if you prefer but each one has made best better or not so good use of the talent, talents placed at our hands and develop them to the best of our possibilities. Some of us are younger, let's say, chronologically speaking, at the age of the eternal spirit, and therefore have not been exposed to all the experiences as equally. I would imagine that all of us in kind of here at this time are not about the same age, but then again, it's, it's a guess, I don't know, that's what I But I know for sure 
that there is a place where we fit and there is a religion, a doctrine, or ideology that fits us in accordance to our development. And you must respect that. And you must understand that each one of us will use that fitness, that synchrony, to the best of our ability for our progress and move on. And you must respect that. And therefore, the way they're going to worship God will vary in very many different ways. And they are all equally good when the desire to worship that divinity is for the good. So they are all absolutely equal. If you're going to worship the sun or if you should worship a well or, or whatever, if it's to produce good, it's equally good. If you understand of God is something that is palpable and it produces goodness to oneself and to your neighbors, it's equally good of the one who has a more abstract concept of the divinity. Absolutely equal. In that point, we are equal. Even if the way that we worship, even with the way that we see God, that we have the understanding of God, it's different. When the intention is to produce goodness, progress to oneself, and the community, it's equally good. And we must be able to respect that. And some of those are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sentences over here. The truth is secure in and of itself. It convinces and does not persecute because it does not need to. <clears throat> Know the truth, and it will liberate you. Oh, Jesus. You better rejecting than truth than accept a lie. Why? Because the truth convinces it's it's secure in 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 honor of itself. It convinces simply by being the truth. And it cannot be imposed upon one. Usually we have to reach that conclusion. We have to, con we have to conclude that indeed this is the truth. And have a, a reasonable methodology that God took me to that conclusion. Yeah, it's, it's the truth. You know, Jesus brings the best recipe for our happiness. It's up there in one way you reason it, and we agree or disagree. Having um, a thought process based on what it has studied, have been exposed to, to agree or disagree that statement. But it, we cannot convince anyone that that's a fact. Of course, I believe that eventually everyone who does the homework will reach that conclusion. But I cannot impose that conclusion upon anyone. I'm optimistic that all of us eventually will reach that conclusion. Not say that everyone will become Christians but we will adopt Jesus' teachings as the best recipe for our happiness. The spirit is an opinion, a belief, and even if it were religion, which is telling you it's not religion, right? If it were religion, I mean it's not. Why would persons who have who not have as much freedom to say what they they are spiritism as they would say that they are Catholics, Jews, or Protestants. Well, the, 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 the reasons because 
it clashes with their beliefs and because of our right, we demand everyone thinks like us and do not spread anything that is contrary, contrary to our belief because we are extremely selfish and prideful. We, we live, we are privileged to live the days that we live. That we can go out there and say that we are spiritual most of the time. Most of the time. Um, I believe in New York City, I think we have that that freedom to express our beliefs. No one wants to hear what it is, like, that's fine. And most does not want what to hear, but when they say I'm a spiritist, they say, okay, fine. Yeah, we have meetings and we talk to discard the spirit. Yeah, fine, I don't care. At one point, there would be, that would put your life at risk to say that some, some part of the world top perhaps today is still the, is the case. We don't have to carry such a heavy burden any longer for being spiritist. But at one point, the pioneers of spiritism, they have to endure a tremendous amount of injustices, lost lost a job. It's it's factual, be humiliated in public and being considered an outcast of society of religiosity associate spiritism with the work of the devil and all kinds of craziness that you can not we cannot even imagine the suffering that people have to endure the pioneers of of this doctrine to those that we do all tremendous um gratitude to to endure what they did endure so we can have that flexibility that have the easiness that we have today most of the time, most of the places. I'm sure someone can bring um, testimony of hardship that themselves or someone they know have to go through just because of being a spiritist. It still happens, but it's not as it was before. There's a case like I said here before, I think it was in the 50s, that a member of a spiritual center was going door to door asking for any help um, to help the poor. Most of the spirit centers in Brazil do that um, soup, provide food once a week, thing to the, to the less privileged. And once he knocks at a door, carrying his, his ID, you now this Spiritist groups such and such, you know, he was asking for food, to knock at the door and ask if he had anything to provide for for the poor and the woman saw the crasha, the the idea, so the spiritual said, hey, you are in the spiritist and so to push him out and spit on his face. How dare you knock on my door, you would for the devil it is and that spit on his face. He took his hand shift. Shift, you know, the, paper, the cloth that most men would wear in the 50s, clean up his face and said, this was for me, thank you. Now, do you have anything for the poor? That is the kind of hardship and that was the kind of attitude that a lot of spiritists had to have. So we can have the kind of easiness that we have today. But when Kardec puts over here for the enemies of the spiritism, he's talking about something that was very concrete that perhaps you don't feel, you don't see today, but they did. And we have to be very grateful to them. Ebony? Oh, I just wanted to, um, to say that these hardships are being endured by a lot of people, even to this very day. Mm -hmm. Um, I can testify to, um, I don't know about others in Grenada where I am, but I have been sent to uh, the, what we call the madhouse over six times mm -hmm. um, and uh, just ordering books here in this country, um, Spiritist Books. It's a challenge to 
to clear those books through customs. Um, really? Yes. Uh, so uh, a lot of us, we suffer in silence, but um, because spiritism here, it is considered demonic. And um, studying it, you, you, you uh, appear as a threat to uh, the religious establishment, especially if you are a member of a particular religion. Um, you are considered to be someone who the devil would easily possess and infect um, a lot of people in the church. I mean, the, the ignorance is staggering. Um, and I can personally testify to uh, having been locked up, quote unquote, locked up in um, uh, 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 the crazy house, psychiatric, wa psychiatric wards uh, for length. Uh, lengthy times mm -hmm. and um, um, even being cast out out of um, you know your family and so on um, so it is it is still a challenge wow my goodness thanks for sharing that <laughs> as a, a palpable example of what we are talking about here and that's why in the beginning I said at least here in Nova York we have this business um <clears throat> one of the problems that I that I see is I don't say countries that have something as an official religion. That puts a tremendous difficulty to the expression of other religions because if it's official, everything outside of the official can see can be seen as unpatriotic, as not in accordance with it the laws of the land, all kinds of things. Brazil had that problem when Brazil was officially Catholic religious, no longer is, that was taken off, thank God. But that is a true example of things that has happened. And um, and if you do practice mediumship, then, yeah, then you are associated with the devil, with this and that, all kinds of things. So that is. Tremendous adversaries of our spirit is, is still living today. It's very unfortunate. Just a curiosity, is Gran Granada is, is um, as an official religion? Yes, Christianity um, is considered to be the official religion. Um, but but Protest there, Protestant, which yeah, kind? Protestants. There are some Muslims as well. And um, there are also um, the, I think in Brazil, it's called uh, Shango Baptist. I, I don't know, but, or Santeria. Um, it's like, it's an African based religion um, mm -hmm. where um, a lot of mediumship is, um, uh, is practiced. So there's also that here as well, but the main religion is, um, is Christianity, the majority being Catholics. Oh, okay, Catholics, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting to say Christianity, but in spiritual means Christianity as well, right? <laughs> that's the, that's the, the hard path to take, that spiritual means 100% Christian. Have you met any other spiritists in Grenada, or is it just you? So far. No, there are none. There are none. Like <laughs> just it you. is just me, and it is such a pleasure. Um, I, I mean, now I understand why I went through so, and I'm still going through so much challenges, um, because my faith uh, helps in in a lot of ways to disseminate um, the information that Spiritus brings, not through the books per se, but just through. Um, my life just and me giving testimony for example there are lots of people from some of the churches that i've been to who come to me today um and they ask me how did you overcome this how how did you um how are you today considering what we know you've been through and then i i get an opportunity to share with them um you know um some of the information that spiritus teaches us so Thanks we have the big, the big names were able to give the testimony. We we'll hear the stories of Chico Xavier or the hardship they have to go through of 
Jeval Pereira Frank and the big names. But there are that hundreds of thousands of the the ones that are not project out there that suffer pretty much equal <clears throat> um, tortures and injustice. People lost job. Oh yeah. As I said, it was taken away from um from the family circle, you know, to make to have made a decision of find a better fit as the spirit puts over here for oneself, a better way of expressing their worship, just to have that to find what serves them better, to make themselves better, being complete taken away from the family circle and lost jobs and be associated with the devil happened. Not as much as today, but as you proved to us just now, it still happens today, and one must have tremendous amount of faith, especially in the teachings of Jesus when he says, you know, blessed are those who hunger for justice, they will be filled. You know, blessed are they who suffer persecution for righteousness, for there is the kingdom of heaven. One must believe in it with the intelligence of the heart. With yeah. reason. Uh, I mean, there are some places, uh, I'll give another example. There are some places in Grenada um, where the elderly, uh, literally, um, they are thrown to die, thrown away to die, uh, because they are considered to be possessed by the devil. And very few people go to visit them. Family members, um, you know, they no longer visit them. And to me, it is a pleasure to go and visit and to spend time with them because I know I know that the devil doesn't exist. So um, the the staff that are there, they often look at me and they say, Ebony, what are you doing here? How is it that you come here? And again, it gives me an opportunity to share some of the books and to talk to them and to help alleviate their fear. Um, so, but like I said, it's still a challenge. And um, just by the way that you live um, gives them proof that what it is that this person believes in, um, I want to study it. I want to know what it's all about. But there is still that underlying fear that maybe uh, it works for her, but it perhaps wouldn't work for me. Yeah, the most important thing you said is that, yes, just by the way that I live, because it is the example that really bring people to better understanding, not what is written in the books or anything else, but why the way you apply what's written in the book in our lives, that will really make people look at it with the different eyes. And perhaps some will actually follow it eventually. But yes, it's the way that we live our lives, the way that we apply what is in the books, that really makes the difference. Thank you so much, Abani, for this. Another absolutely great sentence. A belief is either true or false. If it's false, false, it will fall by itself. Because error cannot prevail against the truth when minds are enlightened. Okay. Know the truth, and the, the truth will free you. But in order to know the, the truth, we have to enlighten our minds are to enlighten ourselves. If it's true, persecution cannot render it false. The, the truth will always prevail for the simple fact that is the truth. With this basically repeating the phrase, the truth is secure in and of itself. It convinces and does not persecute because it does not need to. Having this understanding become a lot easier to deal with those who see spiritism as an enemy, an enemy of their religions, when in reality, especially the Christians run. <laughs> but there's nothing more Christian than spiritism. I'm not saying that spiritism is more Christian than others, but I'm saying that the others are not more spiritists or more Christians than spiritists. Okay, is at a minimum equal, right? 
and it's true, and the persecution cannot render it false. And more than that, it's true because it presents fact. It, pre it presents evidences. It is true because it's based on reason, not on dogmas and not on rituals. It is true because it can be argued, it can be challenged, it can be contested, and one should. Spiritus ask it from us. And when we enlighten ourselves, when we enlighten our mind, then you see the truth in it. And there is no way to take from us the truth when we do the question, when we do the challenging, when we seek to true evidences, then there is no way. If Kardec went after the answers to prove that it's false, he found the truth and said, oh, it's not false, it's true. I have to render to the truth. Now let me store it. What is the intelligence that is providing answers that cannot be a chair, that cannot be a table? They don't have intelligence. And then he discovered, he discovered the truth. But true challenging, true question, true to defiance even, but being enlightened to admit, to accept the facts as they are. Those who have the freedom to do so, those who are not prisoner of a box, instead of a box of a dogma, will question, will seek, and will find. That's what Jesus asked us to do, right? Ask and you'll be answered. Seek and you find. Knock and you will open. But one must, one must have that freedom of mind to seek, to knock, to ask, and of course to look. Another brilliant question, a sentence, this sentence, persecution is the baptism of every new idea that's great and just. I think that is just a fantastic. And I, and I think if all of us question in history, you'll see the truth of that statement. Every great idea, every new paradigm who had this cut that have the catalytic effect of propelling humankind morally and intellectually suffered persecution. Suffers or persecuted. Was really Spinoza, he was so <laughs> highly, um, not that everything I agree with everything that he says, but most of it, yes. Has some great idea, but was very severely persecuted for having those ideas. Um, Gandhi, Mandela, everything that has catalytic, catalytic effect in our progress will challenge the establishment. Will challenge those who would have to give up something in order to accept this new paradigm, this new great idea that had just emerged. And not everyone is willing to give up that little thing, that illusion of power or everything else. So indeed, I challenge anyone to, to say that these statements are not truthful. Persecution is the baptism of every no idea that's great and just. It increases with the greatness and importance of the idea. The animosity and wrath of its enemy are in proportion for the fear it steals in them. It is for this reason that Christianity was persecuted in the past and why spiritism is today but with the difference that Christianity was persecuted by pagans, whereas Spiritism is persecuted by Christians. That's the very sad part of that. I do understand that when Spiritism came in with these brilliant new ideas that would shake heads, that would 
shake the establishment that would make people try to put a quick stop on it because we we would change so much everything else. But I would also expect that by that time, not too long ago, 150 years ago, those same minds would turn around and see the truth, the facts of it, and, and take it. But it's, it's unfortunately our selfishness and our pride is it, is way too big for us to be willing to give up that illusion of power that we have, but cannot be stopped. Again, cannot be stopped. And especially but the so-called Christians. But then again, Jesus warns us there will be false prophets. There will be the wolf dressed in sheep clothes. And um, John the Evangelical warns us, test the spirit to see if they are from God. So those warnings was given to us even by Jesus we expected that to happen. And we as Christians we need to follow uh, uh, teachings, teachings. We have, to, we have to have the courage of the pioneers of Christianity who have their body destroyed, served as lunch for the hungry lions in the, in the Colosseums for the enlightenment of the pagans, for the enjoyment and sort of the pagans. To have that kind of faith is, is absolutely required to go on and, and continue to progress inside of this doctrine. It is a test of faith, for it will be because of your courage, resignation, perseverance, that God will acknowledge you to be among God's faithful servants, of whom he is even now making note so as to give all their share according to their deeds. We did not become spiritists just as a <clears throat> gratuity of destiny, right? I like to believe that spiritists becomes a spirit through use and reason, not because, oh, my mom is a spiritist, my dad is a spiritist, I have to be a spiritist. I like to believe that that's not the fact that spiritists are spiritist. But the fact that spiritists are spiritist because they find in it a, the best fit for themselves, where they sit today in the more intellectual progress. They're the one who if it does not answer all the questions, at least answer a question that others does, does not, or the doctrines does not, and more important, gives you the freedom to question, even to reject the truth, if that does not fit you at that moment. I like to believe the spirit is a spirit for that reason. Not because I was born in a spiritist family, I must be spiritist. Because then you are not a real spiritist. Right? Um, any comments, any questions there? Yeah, I think you, you covered uh, everything there, but uh, it's really a beautiful uh, passage that Kardec wrote here, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it's incredible how 160 years later, which is when the gospel was first published, we're still facing with all these challenges, right? Um, not only in spiritism, but everywhere, right? Uh, religious people are persecuted if they are minorities in many places, right? Um, which is really 
uh, unfortunate. But again, uh, we progress slowly. Truth will prevail always. And, uh, and we move on, right? Because again, we believe this, we used to believe that the earth was the center of the universe, right? And those that uh, try to disprove it were killed, were burned, were put in prisons. And Earth continue not being the center of the universe. And we move on, right? Nowadays, I, I don't think anyone questions that. So with all the truths, they will eventually prevail. And uh, our job is to, to do our part, right? And uh, I think what Ebony mentioned was very uh, beautiful, right? Her going to to visit uh, the people that are persecuted, that are put aside of society, to give them some hope, because it will it will have an effect on their lives, and it will have an effect on the every on on everyone's involved. Yeah, and it's, it's very important what you said. I mean, it, there is progress. It's an unden undeniable. Um, if not, not reached equally all parts of the globe, it's for a reason, it's for purpose also. <clears throat> but um, the kind of discrimination and humiliations, let's say, that spirit is softer, to a whole Brazil, now it's much lesser. I'm sure that there is more centers in Brazil that it still thinks that it's happening in Grenada, may still be happening in Brazil in small centers, but as, as a country itself, it has improved tremendously. Uh, in the US, we have that, at least in New York, you know, I, I always like to say that I live in New York, not in the US, because I don't know the whole US, I can talk about New York. But I'm sure that somewhere throughout the US, there then still be this kind of popular discrimination happening, although illegal, as it's happening still in Grenada, which I'm shocked and very sad to hear. But what's going to change? These individuals like, like Ebony, who has the faith, has the courage, to go through without discriminating, without creating a war, because if she creates a war, she's going to be crushed. She's going to, going to win, win the establishment, but she's going to win with her behavior. The people are going to see what it brings to her and say, wow, let me see what's, what's behind of this that will make the difference. And that's the way it happened in Brazil. And that's the way that Shuk Xavier went to be a, a, a Satan, basically, by the Catholic Church. By the time he, di he died, bishops would tell him that if he, was Catholic, if he was Catholic, he would be canonized. So he went from being the, you know, the Satan himself, to the point when he died, recognize what he has done, what he has spoke, what he has done. He says, if he was Catholic, he would be canonized. Without war, without ever say anything bad, harmful towards the same individuals who accuse him of all kinds of horrible things. That's the great examples that we need to follow. And you have Chuck Xavier, Devout Pera Frank, the ones that come on the news and we talk about, but they have that hundreds of thousands like Ebony doing the same thing. And those are the guys who carry, who makes the difference and who will make it spiritism acceptable, eventually perhaps even liked. And eventually, because it is the truth, will not be the religion of the future, but will be the future of religion, as Kardec says. It's interesting that you mentioned Chico, right? Chico Xavier, and uh, because he always defended the Catholic Church. He always had only praise for the Catholic Church, uh, even when he was attacked all the time. 
you can say that he was in the true sense he was much more ca catholic than all the catholics that, that were oh. persecuting him yep now you go to to the prayer okay 52 oh lord through jesus you said to us blessed are they who suffer persecution for righteousness forgive your enemies pray for those who persecute you and he himself showed us the way by praying for his murderers okay following his example dear god we implore you your mercy on those who do not know your divine precepts, the only ones that can ensure peace in this world and in the other. Like Christ, we say to you, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Give us the strength to patiently and resignedly bear their mockery, insults, slander, and persecutions as trials for our faith and humility. Keep from us any thought of reprisal, for the hour of your justice will sound for all, and we await it by surrendering to your holy will. Thanks. Um, I don't really have anything to add to this prayer. I think we covered, talking about everything that's to be said. The only thing that I would add is perhaps you can use this prayer as um, Mother Teresa said that the prayer is a exercise for the will and took me a long time to grasp what her meaning mm -hmm. what she says about that and I think that's that's what it is you can use this prayer as an exercise for our will to sincerely in our heart have the ability to say Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. Mm. Without any hypocrisy, with all, all heart, with meaning in our essence that you really mean it. Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. With personally, I think myself now, it's a very hard thing to do. I have to use this, this prayer here as an instrument to redirect my will to eventually be absolutely sincere with any hypocrisy when I say forgive them but they not know what they do. Did you hear me? Do you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, because there is a... There is a once, give me one sound that has been signed out here. Good. Yeah. Yeah. If you can hear me, you can hear me. That's good. All right. Everything okay? Okay. If uh, anything has anything to add, anyone has anything to add here? Um, I think we covered everything already. Okay. okay. So now in, in a new topic, mm -hmm. uh, we end the the part of forgiveness for the enemies personal enemies and enemies of the doctrine as a whole. And we now like to take a look at the newborn. Okay. Prayer for a newborn child. Introduction. Spirits reach perfection only after having passed through the trials of corporeal life. Those in the spirit world wait for God to allow them to take up another existence that will furnish them a means of advancement either through the expiation of their past wrongs by means of the vicissitudes they must endure or by fulfilling a mission that is useful to humankind. Their advancement and future happiness will be proportional to the manner in which they will have employed the time they must spend on the earth. The job of guiding their first steps and of directing them toward the good is entrusted to their parents who will answer to God for the way they will have fulfilled their man mandate. It is in order to facilitate its execution that God made parental and free our love a law of nature, a law that is never violated with impunity. 
Now you see here what, what we mean that in this collection of prayer Kardec brings a whole synthesis of this book. And this book is a synthesis of the whole uh, doctrine itself, because we know that the philosophical and the scientific aspects of the doc doctrine are just tools for us to grab what they bring to us with the moral upgrade. And the moral upgrade is this book in itself. But in order to reason, to be able to accept everything that is there, because you are an intelligent being and you question the, the, the scientific aspects of the doctrine and the philosophical aspects of the doctrine of almost prerequisite was to take in all those moral teachings with reason, not in a dogmatic or critical sense, but with reason. And this is one very big aspect of the doctrine, reincarnation, you know, newborn child. The child is newborn, the spirit is, is not the first go round here, is is a return returning to the to the school, to the hospital, right? Bring all of it back, the moral and intellectual. The intellectual may not be applied in one incarnation for specific reasons, but doesn't mean that one loses it, it's there. It may actually be used in a different way, right? The musician that everyone likes to use, Mozart, may not be able to reincarnate and do music again because he needs to expand his horizon and, and, and deal with things differently. But we know that music has a lot to do with mathematics, so he may be a great engineering, he may be a great uh, architect. Music and architecture is walk side to side, it means everything is together there, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't lose his ability, he didn't lose his geniality, just not going to be used in music, or maybe used in architecture, maybe used in other form, it's there. But the point is that that spirit comes with tremendous amounts of bag, with a bag already, the moral, the intellectual, the, um, the vices that you can need to get rid of, and the virtues that we all need to conquer, right? To transform those vices into virtues. And the job of guiding the first, first steps and of directing them towards the good is entrusted to their parents who you answer to God for the way they will have fulfilled their mandate. So this is a very, another big aspect of the doctrine, right? Thing does not happen by chance. This old spirit comes in as an empty canvas is the responsibility of the parents to paint the best possible picture on that empty canvas. To be able to redirect the intellectual ability towards goodness, to redirect the resent resentments, the anger, the hate towards someone else, toward at least indifference, if not towards love, right? It's the the job of the parents to provide that direction and redirection when necessary. <clears throat> of course, the parents will do their part with no guarantees that the receiving spirit will accept those directions and redirections, right? <clears throat> So it seems that the prayer for the newborn, yes, the prayer for the newborn, but it's equally 
to their parents as well, right? It's I think it's very clear over here that this prayer just there's a spirit who is coming back to the school. We need help. Uh, most of the time, okay, and there is exceptions that we're going to read in the prayer here. And the both parents and this coming spirit have received guidance, have received instructions on how to deal with this new experience, with this new relationship that is starting now. Because God is just and not going to throw us into this new experience without any preparing us for it. So parents, equally father and mother, and, um, and the child, they have received the syllabus of say of that's the ob objective, this is the challenges, this is what you know, you should pursue both parents and child. And I think a prayer for newborn child is extremely important only for the child, the child or for the parents who now have this very important mission. It is a mission to fulfill. Comments? Let's go to the prayer. Okay. The prayer by the parents. Spirit who has incarnated in the body of our child, be welcome among us. Almighty God who has sent it to us, may you be blessed. It is a deposit that is entrusted to us and for which we must render an accounting someday. If it belongs to a new generation of good spirits who are to populate the earth, we thank you, O oh God, for such a favor. If it is an imperfect soul, our duty is to help it, it progress on the path of the good through our counsels and our good examples. If it falls into evil because of us, we will be answerable to you, for we will not have fulfilled our mission on its behalf. Lord, uphold us in our task and give us the strength and will to fulfill it. If this child must be the subject of a trial for us, may your will be done. Good spirits who have come to preside over its birth and who are to accompany it during its life, do not forsake it. Keep from this child wicked spirits who may try to induce it to evil. Give it the strength to resist their suggestions and the courage to patiently and resignedly bear the trials awaiting it on the earth. O oh God, you have entrusted me with the destiny of one of your spirits. Enable me, O oh Lord, to be worthy of the task that has been imposed upon me. Grant me your watch care. Enlighten my mind so that I may discern early on the inclinations of the child that I must prepare to enter your peace. God of goodness, since you saw it fit to allow the spirit of this child to come once again to endure the earthly trials destined to enable it to progress, grant it your light so that it may learn to acknowledge, work, love, work, 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 worship you. By your own importance, enable this soul to regenerate itself in the fount of your divine teachings. Under the guidance of its guardian angel, may its intelligence grow, develop, and make it aspire to draw closer and closer to you. May the knowledge of spiritism be the shining light that enlightens it throughout, throughout the choices of its life. Finally, may it learn to appreciate the full extent of your love that puts us to the test in order to purify us. Lord, cast a parental eye upon the family to whom you have entrusted this soul. May they understand the importance of their mission and enable good seeds to germinate in this child until the day in which... Through its own aspirations, it could ascend by itself to you. Dear God, dying to answer this humble prayer, in the name and by the merit of that, that one who said, let the little children come unto me, for the kingdom of heaven is for those who are like them. Thank you. This over here in this set of prayers, no, not one prayer, but three different prayers <clears throat> with the same objective. Remember when it starts the chapter, 
uh, Kardec discusses the prayer having an objective, have a purpose, and not being just words thrown out there. Uh, we spoke about having this, in general, prayer should have these three parts, right? The, the worship, the petition, and the gratitude. We see them in all of the prayers over here, right? Um, without excess of words, without um, going outside of that objective or that purpose, okay, being focused on that, without seeking to be fancy and speaking words that we don't even know what they mean of ourselves, right? Um, A prayer of one who understand the mission of the parents, one who understand the free will of the coming spirit, one who understanding that the spirit is already coming with a baggage of things that he or she needs to accomplish and he or she needs to struggle to overcome, you know, the vices that we have. A, accumulated throughout our existences and I'm um, going to do our best to get rid of it. We understand the difficulties that we're going to be challenged. Very important. Uh, I'll be with you on Nina Tell Ebony. Very important that it makes a differentiation of basically two kinds of spirits, right? if it belongs to the new generation of good spirits who are to populate the earth, we thank you. Meaning, if it is a spirits who are more evolved than what we are right now, according to the law of progress, if it is the, the, the coming spirit is the ones who are coming to transform this planet and the planet of regeneration from a planet of trials and expiation, thank you. Thank to give us this blessed opportunity to receive a more enlightened spirit. But it could be the other way also, right? If it is an imperfect soul, our duty is to help it progress on the path of the good through our counsels and our good examples. More important, our good example, of course. So basically two kinds, you know, the ones who come more evolved than us and the one who basically who comes to help us, right? The ones who are more evolved and the ones who are less evolved and are in great need of us to learn from us, to receive our counsels and to see our examples. If it falls into evil because of us, will you be answerable to you? For will you not have fulfilled our mission on its behalf? If it falls into evil because of us. It's very important. I provide the counsel. I served as an example. My counsels, my examples are completely ignored. I done my part. There's not any cutting. I recognize that this is a a spirit that has free will, that needs to use that free will and associate with the intelligence, retrieve their actions and, and thoughts through their own conscience and use it to produce goodness. And if they do, they don't, there's a good chance that they will fall, fall into evil. Right? It's, Love cause and consequence, but not because of us. We do not bear. And if we did, which is possible, because maybe I drop the board and fulfill my mission. I am ready and willing, I'm not really, but ready to answer and to deal with the consequences of my failure over here. Right? So, Basically, is a, is a prayer for spiritists because we have to understand 
of reincarnation. We have the, the understanding that this spirit comes to us. It's, it's, it's not a little angel that God gave to me. Maybe on the contrary, maybe a little devil that God entrusted that I have the tools that can provide the counsels and the examples to redirect the energies and the thoughts of that spirit. And I understand that it's up to that spirit to take those cancels, to take the, follow the examples I cannot force. Right? You can bring, bring the horse to the water, but you cannot make it drink. So it's a very, it, it's again, it's a complete package of the whole doctrine in the sets of prayers over here. Uh, Ebony? Yes. Um... When we see the title, um, Prayer for a Newborn, um, I know one might think that this is a prayer that we say for a child who is just born. But um, as we've learned in Spiritism, um, the reincarnation process uh, is not fully complete until, if I remember correctly, seven years of age. Um, and I know I have been, from time to time, been reminded uh, to say this prayer for my granddaughter, who is five. And um, it, it really, really helps. So I, I guess I'm just sharing that, you know, um, it is a prayer that we can say for, for children, uh, for toddlers, not just for children who are just born, um, because it applies to them as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, absolutely, yes. That you can repeat, repeat this prayer, and and for us, the parents, and in the case for you, the parent, and as well, right, to keep remind ourselves of of the values that is bring to us in this in these prayers. Yes, it's at the moment of the birth of that of that little tiny physical body bring. Uh, all the spirit most of the time, right? But it is that with the process of the chronolog aging of that spirit, and yeah, especially on the, the thing of the first seven years, is the, perhaps the most important, uh, it's hard to say most important, but extremely important, because that's the time of the empty canvas that you have the opportunity to paint the picture. Right. From that on, that you know, after the seven, then the spirit starts to bring more of its own personality and becomes that there is already something in that canvas that perhaps not gonna be able to erase or not gonna be able to modify it. You know? And then when it comes the terrible teenage years, then years are the moment of suffering for old parents or most parents. Then the spirit is really solidified and brought all his package over there. Hopefully, by then, you are able to really put a nice picture on that canvas that will really redirect the mind, the energy of that spirit. But again, you can only do your part. The spirit may reject everything that you put, throw away that canvas and, and, and stick with the old ones. Very important for the young one and for the parents to keep them to remind themselves of the necessity of being patient, doing the best, understand that that spirit is has its own free will and we cannot in any way take away from that spirit. It's valid for Oh, age basically. All right. Um, any more oh, comments? Oh, yes. Elmo, generally, uh, this is Carol. Hi. Sorry. Uh, yes. Generally, when does the guardian angel or the guardian protector spirit uh, come in to play here? Is it before birth or at birth or right after birth? Any thoughts on that? Even before birth, right? Even when there is, as I spoke of that, uh, getting together in the spiritual world before, even before the um, the coming 
to association with the physical body, there is that period of preparedness. preparedness. Let's, let's, let's sit over here, let's go through the things that you need to accomplish, what are your, what are your tendencies, the things that I have to work on, um, the trials that you that you were going to face, the difficulties that you're going to face. The required energy is already the protecting guidance spirit is already there, working with that spirit even before the direct association with the physical body. That you started doing at that fecundation, right? With associated with that zygote, it starts the the garden angels are already there, even even assisting in the formation of that new body in accordance to the needs of the spirit and with the, all the laws of biology, of course. Wow! Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, it's twelve thirty. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Next week, we'll be doing the Medium's book, okay? Next Sunday. Just a reminder. Okay, so Carol, um, can I make a final prayer? Oh, sure. Um, Elmo, thank you very much for hosting. Uh, thank you, John. And thank you, Sarita, for reading. And Ebony, for your interesting comments. I appreciate it. Infinite creator and supreme intelligence, we give thanks to be together again as brothers and sisters for our studies of the gospel according to Spiritism, chapter being chapter 28, prayers for the enemies of Spiritism and for a newborn child. May we continue to pursue freedom of thought and conscience. May we continue also to respect others for their beliefs convictions and opinions. We do not need to convince others of the teachings of spiritism. The truth will stand by itself and will naturally prevail without imposing beliefs. We are truly grateful for the opportunity and availability to go forward with our spiritist studies and endeavors. We give thanks for the freedom to continue pursuing our intellectual and spiritual growth. May we do our part in mind and heart. We honor our predecessors and the master Jesus for showing us the way forward and for the newborn children and parents as well. We give thanks to our spiritual benefactors and the good spirits for guiding and inspiring us today. May we receive the love, light, and peace of Christ within us for our loved ones, our teachers, our directors, the counselors, the mediums, the workers, and all participants. We pray now for inner peace and especially for world peace and, though, and for those who are suffering in the physical and spiritual worlds. We pray for our center, SGNY, and all spiritist centers throughout the world that they may grow, prosper, expand, prevail, and be protected throughout the day and throughout the night. As we close, we humbly ask for safety and protection as we return to family, friends, loved ones, and coworkers. May we go forth now as beacons of love, of light, of peace, of service, of charity, which is love in action. May peace and love prevail, so be it.